the disability that I live with is uh, paraplegia. It's Asia A T10 complete, so that's around the belly button level, paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and I came to that life uh, via a helicopter crash when I was deployed in Afghanistan. We had a catastrophic engine failure. We were right outside the base. Um, long story short, we made a hard landing. That's what they call a hard landing. And both of us luckily survived. There were three Kiowas. That was the airframe that I flew that went down that deployment. We were the only crew that survived. Um, I have a pretty complicated medical history, actually, but uh, the disability that has affected me the most has been epilepsy. I was born with a congenital neuromuscular disease called arthrogryposis. So it basically affects mostly my upper arms and hands, um, but uh, also my legs a little bit too. My disability is that I struggle with depression, chronic depression and anxiety. I'm autistic and I have um, a couple of autoimmune diseases, chronic illnesses. I have cerebral palsy. It does fix my legs, so it makes it hard for me to get around. Uh, I fell from a tree at the age of 21 and I uh, fell 40 feet and hit a big limb that was about 10 feet off the ground and it crushed my pelvis and ripped my spinal cord in half. And, uh, and yeah, life changed at that point in time. My disability is a form of autism. It's called Asperger syndrome. I had a stroke in the womb. The doctor said that I wouldn't be able to walk, wouldn't be able to talk, and that I'd have to be fed through a feeding tube. She's definitely progressed beyond a, a, a vegetable, what they said, and I, I was quoted once saying, you know, I'm not a gardener. I don't know how to raise vegetables, but I'm a mom and I know how to sure advocate for my baby girl. I was diagnosed when I was two years old with autism. So in the beginning of COVID, um, I, I was in second grade. Then like COVID began and then like, and like we had to bring all of our like school stuff back home and I didn't even know why. And they told me COVID was happening. And then, and then I asked them, what is COVID? And then, and then they said COVID-19 was the most dangerous um, virus out there. The NBA announcing they are suspending their season until further notice. The annual Coachella Music Festival in California has been postponed in Washington. The National Cathedral will be closing for at least two weeks. Here in the city of New York, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is canceled. California, Oregon, Washington State have now banned gatherings of more than 250 people. More than 6.6 .6 million Americans filing new claims for unemployment insurance. To Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus a global pandemic. I was feeling trapped in me in my apartment and being black and disabled. And I was basically scared to go outside. So we had been sent home from work, which was supposed to be temporary. And then I think it was that weekend, maybe, I was in line at the grocery store and it was the like most busy I have ever seen the grocery store. I sat on the floor and I started crying because I was like, what happened? I got the phone call saying, don't come in to work tomorrow. We are closed until further notice. I'd say there was um, a lot of uncertainty at that time. At first, we thought we would be disproportionately impacted because of the type of work that we do. And then within like two weeks, the whole world was shut down. The streets were just empty and there was nobody out and, and the big city was quiet. Everything just got so crazy. At one point in time, we had um, four family members in the hospital at the same time. Just, you know, the fear of the unknown. It was when I realized that the public health restrictions were going to inadvertently marginalize people who were already struggling to achieve independence and participate in community and freedom from isolation, that I knew that it was gonna be a serious thing. Hello, my name is Ian Engel, and I'm the executive director at the Northwest Colorado Center for Independence. Our mission is to support people with disabilities to live healthy and safe in our own communities. The steps we had to take to prepare for the pandemic were extensive. I had meeting after meeting after meeting of people trying to figure out how to work together through this, and it was a moving target. In the meantime, we're trying to continue 
to be a resource for some of the people who need it the most. We saw an uptick in suicides, mental health uh, needs on the rise, people stuck in their homes, afraid of this boogeyman. They don't even know what it is, when it's going away, or what to do about it. All they know is that we're locked down and isolated and trying to support people for our staff was, as you can imagine, the emotional bandwidth just got stretched. It was so taxing. My name is uh, Representative David Ortiz. I am the representative for House District 38, which is Littleton and the western parts of Centennial. Um, veteran, advocate, and lobbyist for veterans before I got elected. So for me, I know that I'm in the vulnerable community, so I, I took extra precautions not to be in public, to always mask up as much as possible. Um, you know, I was running for office at the time, so it meant adapting, but here's where the injury helped prepare me for that in a way, unintentionally, was I spent six months as an inpatient in a hospital bed. So the only way I interacted with friends and family if they didn't come see me was via social media. So in a way, that six months of being inpatient prepped me and helped me and my team shift what we were doing during the campaign um, to set ourselves up for success during the pandemic. Because of COVID, every, I mean, a lot more was done virtually. In some ways, I could be more effective because I wasn't having to build in time for taking my chair apart, put it together, or anything else when it comes to self-care, living with this injury. I could do more um, with video conferencing. That being said, since everything was back to back to back, you would always leave the end of the day feeling more exhausted in some ways, and you never get the uplifting feeling of being around other humans, you know what I mean? So um, I think that was the, the biggest transition for me um, in this job going to, into a COVID. My name is Andrea Moore, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of a Denver-based nonprofit called The Wayfaring Band. Hi, my name is Brittany Murdoch, and I am a band member at Wayfair Band and a mixed media artist. Yeah, you're a beautiful mixed media artist with Access Gallery, also another local Denver nonprofit, and a band member with us. And I should tell people that you're not a rock and roll band member because we don't make music, right? We're not a rock and roll band, and Brittany is not a rock and roll queen, although she could be. But the Wayfaring Band is a band of travelers. We do immersive uh, learning opportunities and independent living skills through adventure travel. And our community is folks with and without uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. One of the things that we noticed right away is that it, the people who were thrown early in the pandemic and who were really kind of panicking and losing it were all people who are neurotypical right? So they don't have a cognitive disability and also who are like, you know, physically typical and don't have a physical disability. You know, all of the people who have been sort of privileged by, you know, our systems were freaked. And everybody we knew in the disability community was kind of like, okay, well, <laughs> here we go. We're going on another ride. So one of the first things that we did as an organization was we set up kind of like a community phone tree. It was what do you need? Cool. Who's providing that service? Great. Let us just put A plus B and get you all together. And also, I think it was just the social piece. Like, I don't know, Brittany, do you feel like socially your life changed? I feel like I was not really sociable. I feel disconnected. I used to see my family in person. So when I was not able to um, see them in person, it kind of affected me. I'm more a hands-on person and like to talk to you in person. I'm fine being on video, but it's just, it makes my eyes hurt sometimes. Some of the people that we are, that are in our community, you know, are really very drawn to routine. And so for a lot of folks, the uncertainty of those first few months, it was really throwing so many of the folks in our community who thrive on schedules and routine. Hello, my name is Seth Weschnick. I am a cashier at Arc Thrift Store in Lakewood, Colorado, and I have been here for nine years now. I started to realize that COVID was becoming serious. In all honesty, I started to see it as a little bit of a serious thing when we started having less customers here at the store, which was probably about maybe a month or two before we actually closed down. We were closed for the entire month from the end of March until the beginning of May. I worried about day by day what's going to happen. I focused on the fact of 
staying at home as much as possible. I literally was a couch potato for a month waiting to get a phone call to come back to work. This place is my home away from home. I never thought that it would have lasted as long as what it has, ever. Hello everyone, my name is Julissa Soto. I'm the director of statewide programs for Servicios de la Raza. When I re realized that the pandemic was getting serious is when I went to the store, grocery shopping and everybody was going crazy and running one way to another. And it, I started feeling anxiety because I couldn't find um, food. I couldn't find anything. So ah, that's when I started panicking when I couldn't bring food to my home and I was like wow in my mind I said this is ironic I crossed the border in the trunk of a car coming to a new country to live a better life but therefore I felt that I was like in Mexico again with no food panicking starving and and, and nobody was giving us information at the beginning I felt defeated very defeated I had two choices, either fall asleep forever because I was sleeping and sleeping and being super depressed, or I had the other choice of getting out there and helping others who might not be able to even help themselves. I created um, a drive through food bank in, in El Paso County and Colorado Springs for the monolingual Spanish speaking community. So that would give me a lot of hope that I was giving food to those who number one, cannot afford to buy food. And number two, that they were also scared and, they, and because of their status, they might be undocumented. They didn't know where to go. That made me realize that I was not alone in this. And, um, and my depression and anxiety was not as bad when I was around people who were who were struggling like myself. Hello, my name is Haven Ronert. I've been working for Safeway for 13 years. I'm a volunteer advocate with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I'm going to school full time and I'm highly invested in pursuing my local music career. I realized the pandemic was getting serious when stay at home orders were went into effect and when everyone at work got letters that we were essential workers, so we could, um, any authority figure that stopped us on the way to and from work, we could uh, show them that we are essential workers and we uh, have a job to do. During lockdown, I continued to work. I just started school, so that kept me occupied. And like always, I was very focused on my music. I'm used to be being very active, uh, so not being able to go anywhere besides to and from work. I had to get very creative. There were many days that I would get home from work and put my earbuds in and go out into my balcony and dance in the sunlight. Hello, I'm Alicia Wong. I'm a family medicine physician in Denver. Honestly, I took some solace in the fact that I could go to work every day and kind of contribute to whatever was happening. Um, and that felt like I was, I was doing something. I think the, also the, uh, the indirect benefit of going to work is that I still had my social circle at work that I could see my colleagues every day. And so the social isolation, I didn't really experience as much, I think, as some of my other friends who aren't in healthcare or essential workers. And um, that was helpful to me. I think, I think the camaraderie amongst everybody as well was really important because we were all living with this anticipatory anxiety, you know, the risk of getting exposed, um, infecting other people that we care about, that we live with, um, so all of that. And so I think really just keeping in touch with my family and friends and um, living day to day, kind of not trying to get too wrapped up in the uncertainty was how I dealt with everything. I think all healthcare disparities really kind of got accentuated during the pandemic. I think a lot of uh, the support systems for people with disabilities, like for example, day programs, like they got canceled. And I think the social isolation and consequences of that um, were pretty devastating. I think also have, not having kids go to school was really difficult because a lot of uh, rehab services are through school. And so I had a lot of patients who weren't getting OT, PT, speech, because they weren't going to school in person. Um, and so I think those, those things are in general or what I saw primarily, certainly around the country um, and in the news and the media, there's been a lot of discussions about like 
subjective uh, evaluation of quality of life and care rationing. And um, that was definitely something that I was on my mind as a healthcare provider throughout the past year. Generally, healthcare needs to have better accessibility and tracking disability status, um, even accommodations really easily, um, implementing those accommodations, and then just general cultural competency for people with disabilities amongst healthcare professionals and staff and anybody who works um, and interacts with patients and their families. I think it's gonna be uh, the next probably 10, 20 years uh, to work on, but that's um, something that I'm hoping to change. Hello, I'm Deborah Johnson. I am the General Manager and the Chief Executive Officer for the Regional Transportation District here in Metropolitan Denver. I realized the pandemic was becoming serious. And let me qualify my response by saying I wasn't in the Denver area, I was in the greater Los Angeles area. And I realized it was becoming serious looking at the myriad of news reports and both Mayor Garcetti and the Board of Supervisors had put forward public health orders early on um, the first week in March, which was March 5th. I remember it as if it was yesterday. As related to my job, it, recognizing the role in which I play, it affected me in the sense of trying to ensure that our employees are safe and healthy, uh, but then still having the great responsibility of delivering essential transportation services because while the world stopped, it didn't stop. We still needed to transport um, essential workers, we still needed to ensure that we could provide, you know, paratransit service, fixed route service. And so all of these things were prevalent in the sense that I ensured that I came into the office each and every day because being a leader of an organization, I want to model the behavior I want to see. And if my teammates don't have another option of teleworking, I believe it's incumbent upon me to be present and be at the ready. As long as we have people on this planet, there's going to be a need for transportation. It may not be what we know it to have been pre-pandemic, but we'll still be here. And as we talk about what that is, I think if anything we've learned from this pandemic is to be flexible and agile because we have to be ready to pivot quickly. And so I think if anything, as we go forward, I believe that not everything will be done by texting. Uh, people are picking up the phone to engage and talk to people more. We recognize the importance of taking care of ourselves. Our health is our wealth. And I think there'll be a more laser focus on those elements as we go forward to really relish in the time that we have with our loved ones because there's this old adage, you can never be too busy to stop and get gas. And so as we look at what we're doing holistically, we need to reflect on what's most important to us as individuals. And so I think if anything, we as a society need to come to grips with that. Hello, my name is Claudine McDonald. I am the Community Relations Chief Executive for the Aurora Police Department. Hello, my name is Janae. I am an interventionist slash paraprofessional at Global Village Academy. Well, at the beginning of the school year, everybody was online and remote, so everybody had to do school online. But at like this, after the first or second semester, the kids, half of them came back in person and then half of them stayed at home. Like they had a choice. So that was like double the work. Really, we got busier because obviously that was at a time of need for our community. We did a survey and we saw, we asked our community, what is your biggest need right now? And it was, we need help finding jobs. We need help with our mortgage and our rent and we need food. My team really focused on the food aspect. And so we uh, utilized our partners in the community and we um, utilized the CARES Act funding and we were pushing out um, food like crazy. You know, the nothing about us without us, is, it stands true. We cannot allow the world to move around us. We have to be part of the mix and we have to be part of, uh, of what is being built. Hi, my name is Zoe Collins. I use she, hers pronouns, and I am the Director of Outreach and Communication at The Initiative. Uh, we're a small nonprofit, and we do, we're statewide, and we do victim advocacy for 
survivors of all types of abuse and we specialize in working with survivors with disabilities. So in like all natural disasters is really where we have a lot of data around specifically do domestic violence, but I would extrapolate that it's like all types of violence. The pattern was kind of weird and it was different for different organizations too, which is super interesting. Um, but we had, I think a pretty sharp increase right at the beginning. But what ended up happening is we had an increase in crisis calls, but a decrease in long-term clients. The incidents of violence were more often and worse, um, but then people weren't able to like continue working with an advocate long-term the way that we usually provide services. And it is really hard um, to watch services um, shrink down when the need is growing. I think the way that disabled people have been treated in the last year um, has been very like openly terrible. The lack of the word disability in the last year in the mainstream like conversation is mind-blowing to me that we're talking about like mass disability right and nobody is saying that word like on the news um, or talking about how the pandemic is like extremely disproportionately impacting people with disabilities that we haven't even been tracking that number in the US. Even like the way that people would say things like, oh, it's just the elderly and disabled that will die. It's like, we're not a just. Hi, my name is Miles and I'm nine years old. It was really hard to go into remote class and then in person, and then remote class and back in in person. It was just very stressful for me. Everything was starting to close, and especially school. Everybody had to wear masks and six feet, which was absolutely annoying, washing hands for 20 seconds, and <clears throat> with soap and water, and sanitizing for tons of times, and sanitizing makes my hands dry. But like when it's gone, I'm pretty sure everybody will be excited. And I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a humongous parade after. <laughs> Whoever is going to see this, just be patient with this able community and um, I guess seek out support if you need help. It's okay to ask for help. What I'd like to see is the neurotypical and the able-bodied communities become more resilient. And I think that the way that we can do that is by uplifting the voices and lived experience of people with disabilities and enabling them to be leaders in all of our journey towards resilience. I envision communities where there's all kinds of people, people with wheelchairs and blind and dogs and scooters and aut autists all hanging out and doing their thing in the community and it's business as usual. I think that there's a real opportunity moving forward for the disability community to showcase our resiliency um, by becoming more engaged. We need to be in unity. A lot of the times I feel that the nonprofits, we want to work solo and we need to unite efforts in order to impact communities and create changes. Do not be timid to advocate. Do not be timid to tell your story. Because unless any person that lives with a disability could be an elected leader, then we're not really caring about representation, are we? We're not really fighting for representation. Um, so just being unified with each other and making sure that we're empowering um, each other and ourselves to not be timid and to not be afraid to fight for that access and to push for that access, even if we have to have sharp elbows with it every once in a while. When you have a choice between being right and being kind, always choose kindness, because you never know what somebody's going through. My thing that I, that I always say is, I'm just happy to be here. I say it all the time. <laughs> just happy to be here. Just happy to be here. <laughs>